turn over to Hebrews. Been having uh, every week since we started this series, we've been just reading that whole chapter, or at least first 20 verses of Hebrews 11. But I feel like we're missing out on on some of the stories, uh, so I kind of switched things up and I had him read that long chapter, but great chapter. But I want to go to Hebrews and look at one, let's see, two verses. Hebrews chapter 11. Let's skip down to verse 20. Hebrews 11, 20 says this, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worship, uh, leaning upon the top of his staff. Now, I'm not going to explain that second part uh, in detail. We're not going to go read it or anything like that. But basically, down the road, Joseph ends up uh, having a similar uh, circumstance in that his children are blessed in the opposite manner. He brings them before Jacob, and he puts uh, Manasseh on the left hand and Ephraim on the right hand. And then, and then uh, uh, I said that backwards. And then anyway, so but you see that Jacob, when he blesses them, he switches his hands and he and he and he mixes it up and gives the right hand a blessing to Ephraim. And even, anyway, so it's kind of a similar situation there. I'm not going to make the relation to that, but I want to focus on this story that we just heard uh, the brother brother Justin read. What a story! I mean, what a story! Uh, and really, the whole life of Jacob. You see, kind of, you talk about reaping what you sow. You know, you really see that in his life. And then I just think about just some of the, the weird things in that story. Like, can you imagine being so hairy that in order for somebody to, like, to simulate how hairy you are, they have to actually put animal fur on, <laughs> on their arm? I mean, that's a hairy dude. And, uh, and they, they, they do that. I mean, I know Isaac was old, but come on. I mean, <laughs> that's, a, that's pretty hairy. So, uh, and then they deceive him. You know, it seems really, really cruel thing to do for his wife and his son, son to team up on him. And so the truth is, if you didn't read Genesis 27 first, if you just read Hebrews, and you read that and said, by faith, you know, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. That's it. That's all you got in Hebrews 11. This is the faith chapter. This is saying he is a good man of faith. By faith they did these things, and God blessed them, and, uh, and that's a great picture for us to live by faith. So if you just read Hebrews, hadn't read Genesis, you'd say, man, Isaac must have knew what he was doing. You know, he blessed appropriately and, and uh, knew what he was doing. But when you read the story in Genesis, you see, man, that, that didn't seem right. I mean, obviously, it was part of the plan. Obviously, God did want Jacob to be blessed. We understand that. And, uh, you know, some of Esau's behavior kind of even shows that. You ever think about, you ever notice like when somebody wants to, they want something really bad, right? And you tell them, no, you can't have that. We're going to wait and we're going to watch your behavior or something like that. And they, no, I really want it out. And eventually their behavior kind of starts proving, you know, your point. Uh, one, an example of that would be there's a guy um, that, you know, a long time ago when I first started there at Iola, uh, working for my father-in-law, there was a guy that came back. He had come to the church a long time ago, and then he left, and he started doing some kind of preaching ministry. You know, he was a retired, uh, I think he's like an Army Special Forces. He used to jump out of planes and all this kind of stuff. And, and so now he's, uh, he had this thing in his ministry where he just really liked, he took around these flags and liked to hang the flags, and he liked to talk about America and all this kind of stuff and he ended up starting this little ministry traveling around and preaching something happened he got a divorce uh, with his wife wife and started uh, you know kind of fell away backslid started drinking stuff like that then he ends up cleaning his life up and he comes back to our church there Isla Baptist Temple and he comes in and he begins like in no time at all starting to talk to pastor about how you know he really wants to start this ministry back up and he wants to start preaching and uh, Brother Collins is like, you know, hey, I think we're going to we'll have to just watch for a little while and see how things go. He said, for one thing, he said, I want to recommend, 
you know, everybody can tell when you walk in, we can smell it on you. We can see like you, you really got a bad habit and addiction to the smoking. And, uh, and so we'd like to see you work on that, try to get that. That was kind of a bad testimony. You're going to go as an evangelist and you're going to do that. It'd be good to clean that up. I mean, he wasn't telling them, look, you're going to hell if, you're, if you smoke or something like that. He was just saying, I'll clean that up if you're going to represent and, uh, and preach in that way. And it wasn't any time at long the guy just stopped coming. And he'd go visit him and he'd say, well, I just don't think it's right for the pastor to judge. And he wants us all to be perfect before we do everything. And I'm like, you're exactly proving the point of how you're not ready to do a ministry. right? But that's kind of how people are. Like whenever they're told no, uh, then it's like their behavior kind of proves the point. I remember one time, uh, uh, sorry, I got to always embarrass one of my kids <laughs> during a sermon. But I remember one time Braden was, uh, I felt like being sassy. And, uh, and I was like, Braden, uh, I don't remember how many years ago this was, so I have mercy on him. But he's like, <laughs> he's like, I don't remember, he was kind of talking back a little bit. And I said, you got to watch your attitude. you got an attitude problem. And he said, I don't have an attitude problem. And I said, if you didn't have an attitude problem, you'd know you had an attitude problem. And we just kind of stopped for a minute and tried to let that sink in. What in the world <laughs> did I just say? But it kind of makes sense, right? <laughs> His attitude problem was like, I don't have an attitude problem. And you're just proving the point that you have an attitude problem. But anyway. That's how we are. That's how we are. A lot of times our behavior kind of proves the point. And look at the life of Esau. You realize he wasn't the man to get the blessing. He wasn't the man to carry on God's, God's plan. There's no doubt about it. But when we read the story, all we see is the deceptive nature of, of uh, Rebecca and Jacob and how they, you know, just uh, tricked. I mean, obviously, the story before this, uh, you see Jacob tricking his brother uh, out of his birthright. And then now this. And so anyway, when you read that and you see here's Jacob. Here's another thing about this, a weird thing about the story. You know how old Jacob is? When you read the story, you think he's like this little kid. And his mom's like, all right, I tell you what, you know, we're going to trick your dad. No, the guy's like 40 years old or something like that. I can't remember how old he is. But, but in his mom's telling him, you know, what to do and all this stuff. But it's kind of funny. So anyway, but the chapter, notice, it dwells on Isaac's faith. You're like, what? His faith, what are you talking about? All he did is got tricked and blessed the wrong person, right? The end result of everything in this story was not what Isaac expected, all right? And it certainly wasn't what Esau expected. You know, I guess you could say it was Rebe what Rebecca expected, what Jacob. I don't know if Jacob even knew what to expect. But all the things that happened here, they seem to have happened totally contrary to what, the guy, what Isaac thought was going to happen. And yet we talk about his faith. And so the, what I want to talk about in this message is the surprising outcome that sometimes comes as a result of our faith. You know, we're putting our faith, we're following the Lord, we're wanting to do what would make the Lord happy, we're seeking his will. You know, it's one thing that I've been asked more than anything as a pastor by young people, old people, it doesn't matter, is how do I know when I'm in the will of God? How do I know I'm doing what he wants me to do, whether it's the nature of service or maybe a boyfriend, girlfriend kind of situation or what? How do I know I'm in the Lord's will? And the first thing is, if you want to be in the Lord's will and you're seeking his will and you're and you're praying and asking him to help guide you and all that. Guess what? You're probably going to be in his will in the end. But don't expect that the end is going to look exactly like you want it to look. Number one, the very nature of faith demands that the outcome is probably not going to look like what you expect it to look like. That's kind of faith. If you knew what it looked like, it wouldn't be faith, right? You just try to fill in the blanks and you see, your, you visualize your future and you try to make everything happen the way you want it to. And then when you get there, oh man, I, I walked by faith. No, you didn't. You knew all along what it looked like. You just you had to make yourself get there. But faith, usually, I mean, it's usually going to be, you know, that's by definition going to take you somewhere you didn't expect. All you know is, uh, you know, I'm just following the Lord. You know, I, I see through a glass darkly. <laughs> but I'm just following, waiting for him to show me what it is I need to do. Isn't this contrary to what the world says? I mean, the world says, don't ever let anyone take away your vision and your dreams. You just follow after your dreams. If somebody starts to derail you and take you somewhere else, you know, forget that. Get back and follow your dreams. 
and all that. And look, it doesn't even matter if you're disabled. Follow your dreams. I <laughs> just re- recently listened to, uh, I think it was Pastor Anderson, preaching on uh, how even people with disabilities sometimes, you know, everybody will just kind of lie to them and, and like let them be what they want to be, even though there's no way they could possibly do that in their condition, <clears throat> right? <clears throat> but our society today says you just have a vision, you have a goal, and what do they say? Believe, right? Which is essentially saying have faith. Isn't that the weirdest thing? This is the time of year. You see, believe on everything, right? I saw a T-shirt that said, never stop believing in Santa. And I'm like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. Like, what? <laughs> you don't believe in it. So why would you tell other people to believe in it? But there's this fallacy that, you know, on all the movies and all that, like, oh, but it's just, the, it's just believing. It's not believing, <laughs> right? Believing is saying, I know this is what God wants me to do even though I can't see the end result of it. The end result's probably going to be a surprise to me, but I'm just by faith going to follow and do what the Lord says. Completely different than uh, what the world says, what true faith looks like. Okay? So, you know, everyone on their walls and on the bumper stickers and all talks about believing. They don't even know what to believe, right? So the only thing we have to believe in this life is the Bible. And it's like we're going through life living by the Bible, and it's kind of like... Uh, you know, here one of the scariest times in my life is when we're driving back. Um, I don't remember from where we went on a trip, and when we came back, whole family's in the car, snow's coming down really hard. And it was one of those, it wasn't just snow, it was like the sleet, but it instantly, whenever it hit the windshield, it was freezing up. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter how much defrost you have, how much the windshield wipers are going, it just comes and it freezes up, and I could not see. And I, I, I'm not the greatest driver in the world, but <laughs> when I am driving, I at least like to see, right? And, uh, and I couldn't see, and so I'm freaking out, and I'm, want, I'm driving really slow as it is, and I'm wanting to get off the side of the road, and my wife's like, well, we've got to get through this exit. She said, I can see through the little spot in my side of the glass. And she's like, I'll tell you where to go. I'll tell you what, I, I try to have a lot of faith in the Lord. I love my wife, but that was really hard to put faith in my wife. <laughs> She's like, go a little to the left. You're about to hit the curb. Ah, I can't tell you how frustrating that was and how freaky it was to not be able to see, but just to listen to her give advice and to go, you know, that way. If it was a trust exercise, apparently I failed. But that's kind of how we walk through life, reading the Bible, saying, I don't understand this, but by faith I'm going to follow it. And sometimes the ending... Uh, ends up being completely different than what we thought it was going to be. I'm going to give you a few personal examples. Uh, I hope you don't mind. Some people don't like preachers to use personal examples, but that's all I got. And so uh, here's some personal examples in my life. All right, about 19 years old, uh, I surrendered to the ministry. I just felt like, hey, I want to give my life to full-time service and serve wherever I can. And uh, it was a Wednesday night. I went forward uh, after the service. They gave an altar call, and a, a missionary came. I still remember the missionary. He wasn't a great preacher, but I remember his message was about evangelism, and it was like, you know, hey, we send missionaries. It, it was a very standard missionary message, right? We send preachers across the world, but really your mission field's across the street, and, and everybody that you meet, and it was an evangelistic message. But I remember going forward and saying to the Lord, you know, I want to just... Do whatever it is you have me to do. If you want me to go to the mission field, I'll go to the mission field. If you want me to just start knocking on doors in my neighborhood, uh, I'll, start, I'll start doing that. And I worked at UPS on the night shift at the time. And so at night, uh, I went to work, and there was this guy that passed my way, and it was clear that he was from Africa. And it was really weird. I started talking to him, and I found out he is from the Gambia, West Africa, and it was kind of weird, but all of a sudden I said, I'm thinking about being a missionary to Africa. And I don't know why I said that, but I said that. And he said, well, let me, let's get together and I'll tell you all about my country and I'll help you out and, and all this kind of stuff. Long story short, sort of, <laughs> I went and did meet with him. And, uh, and I had this vision for my life. And I told my pastor about it, I told my parents about it. I said, I don't understand why, but I'm going to go. Uh, pursue this and I'm going to be a missionary in Africa right that's like the most dedicated thing I could do or whatever and so uh, I'm going to be a missionary in Africa so my pastor at the time brother Metzinger so it was gave me this book you know on uh, uh, Curtis I know what's his name uh, Hudson Taylor and a missionary to China 
and he gave me that book and he said, look, there's a college that most of the guys in this circle went to. He said, I don't know really what else to tell you other than maybe you want to pursue going to that college. And I said, well, I prayed it was BBC, Baptist Bible College, and it was part of the BBFI. And he warned me that there were some things going on that weren't so good at that time. But I had a vision in my life. And I said, I'm stepping out by faith, man. I'm just going. Don't have a job. Don't have anything lined up. Don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going to Bible college. And I'm going to graduate in four or five years. I knew I was going to get married in that time. And, uh, and I had things kind of planned out in my life. I knew by this age, I'm going to be on the mission field. And I'm going to go. And that's kind of how we do sometimes. We have this vision of what we want our ministry to look like. And we say, that's it. I'm surrendering to this mission field. Right? I've grown up my whole life. I've seen kids do that. They go forward to the altar and they say, oh, I want to go to India. I want to go to Africa. I want to go. And they got this particular field. And I'm like, dude, you're 10 years old. <laughs> right? How about just be faithful to church? Right? Read your Bible. Do all these things. Let the Lord guide you down, down the road. But they have this plan in their head. Some, some actually get there, you know, but, but what I'm saying is have faith in God and have faith that I'm going to step out there, follow him. He's going to guide, he's going to direct my paths and I'm going to end up where he wants me to go. So I got to Bible college and I'm thinking, I'm going to graduate. They're going to teach me all the doctrine I need to know. Then I'm going to go and, and be accepted by the BBFI. It's a missions uh, program, whatever that sends the people out. Then I'm going to be on the mission field, have all my bills paid, my insurance, all this kind of stuff there. And while I'm there, I realize I've got professors teaching me Calvinism. And I'm like, that doesn't sound right. And i got professors saying, well, you know, the King James Bible isn't actually the most, uh, you know, uh, it's not the best translation out there. And one guy literally said, like, the only reason I use it in this classroom is because I'm required to. But really, I think the ESV or something like that would be much better. And I'm thinking, this ain't right. Something's not right, you know. But I could have said in my heart, like, yeah, but by faith. I mean, this is, I stepped out on faith, and this is where God wanted me to go. But I knew in my heart something's not right. I got plugged into the church that I was going to out there. They were really solid on the King James. There were some guys in there who had battled the professors at BBC, and they had gone through all this. And I began to learn from them and begin to grow something completely different than what I originally vision, vision, envisioned. However, stepping on faith, found myself right in the will of God. Does that make sense? Now, you say, well, yeah, you never should have went to Bible college, whatever. Look, I don't know. I can't rewind. I can't go back and redo the future. All I know is I want to serve the Lord. I want to please Him. I want to fulfill His will. Sometimes I go this way and I say, oh, man, I made a big mistake. Well, guess what? He's going to direct my path and make it all work out. I'm following him, and I'm, and I'm, I'm walking in the footsteps that he, he guides me to. So I stopped going to college there, but I try to get actively involved in the church. And then Heartland Baptist Bible College opens up, and I think, that's it. The Lord wants me to go there. Some of my friends have left that college go there. These guys, they believe right. I'm going to go, and, I'm gonna, and so I step out by faith, quit my job, don't have any money. By this time, I got, a, I got one kid. And, uh, and we go, and I'm thinking, you know, man, all right, I'm going to go there. Now I'm going to finish, send out by the right. In fact, I'm not even going to be sent out by a, an organization. By this time, I matured. And I said, hey, we don't need, you know, an, uh, 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 whatever you call those sending boards uh, over me, right? I'll just go out independently, find a good church that will back me up, send me, and I'm just going to go out by faith. But I had that plan, still going back to the same place, right? But I'm thinking I'm going to go there. So I go to Heartland, and... Uh, Lo and behold, I find out, you know what? I'm getting way more out of serving in the local church there than I am the Bible college. And it's no, you know, not me trying to talk bad about the professors or anything like that. It's just like, why can't I, like, learn through the local church? So my, my thought process started to change a little bit, but I'm still there. I'm still learning under good people. I got thrown into the bus ministry where I learned a whole lot about ministry and about soul winning and about dealing with people and going into the ghettos and learning how to duck behind cars when gunshots are being fired. And it's a good skill. It's important. <laughs> right? And, uh, and I learned a lot of valuable things there. And I feel like I was right in the center of God's will. But it's not at all where I envisioned it was going to be. Right? And if I had to go back and replay it again, it's probably not the first 
the, the choices that I would make. But it's the choices I made in a sense, and I stepped out uh, by faith in that way. I could take you down the whole list of all the things, how I ended up at Iola Baptist Temple, right? How I ended up becoming, how I almost went to Texas and worked for a guy out there, and the Lord shut that door. How I uh, uh, ended up uh, getting involved with this, with you guys, and starting this work out here. And you say, when well, going back to the very beginning, when I surrendered to the ministry, did I envision any of this? No. By now, I thought I was in West Africa, right? Uh, one of the most unreceptive places in the world. They, they do speak English, fortunately, but they're very Muslim and they're very uh, uh, friendly, right? They'll, they'll be kind to you, but ultimately, from what I've heard of every missionary that's gone there, unreceptive, right? And so who knows what would have happened if I would have forced, you know, open the door and went according to what I thought God's plan was, all right? So here's what happens. We walk by faith, and we end up realizing at the end, like, this isn't the way that I expected this to turn out, all right? This is what happened in the life of Isaac, I believe. Here's the question, okay? So by the very nature of faith, it demands that the outcome doesn't have to uh, be what we expect or what we want. But here is the question. How do you respond when the outcome is a surprise to you? Because it's going to be a surprise to you. If you're walking by faith, you're going to be like, whoa, didn't see that coming. Sometimes it'll be like, no, that's not what I want. And it's a surprise. How did that happen? I don't understand, right? Here's the question. How do you respond? Do you react the way that Esau reacted? You know, he thought he had his plan all set out. I'm the oldest child. I'm going to get the birthright. I'm going to do this. And so here's what happens. Turn back to Genesis 27. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'd be pretty upset. My brother tricked me, deceived me, pulled all these tricks, you know, on me and, and, and got away with something like that. I'd be pretty upset. But, but here's how uh, Esau deals with it. Genesis 27, look at verse 34. Esau heard the words of his father. He cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father, like a little brat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's, he's crying and saying, bless me also. And he said, thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, is not he rightly named uh, Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, hast thou reserved a blessing for me? He's trying to change the outcome. You know, Isaac's basically saying, look, it's already done. It's already been done. I can't undo it. And he's saying, come on, can't you change that? Can't you change that? He's wanting to change. Uh, he doesn't, he's not happy with the way things ended up, and he's wanting to, uh, to change that. Look at verse uh, 38. He says again, Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice, and he wept. Now you think, okay, he had a good cry, realized, come to terms with the fact that this is not what God wanted in his life, and then he went back to just serving the Lord, right? No, that's not what happens at all. Okay, he uh, starts out, he's whining, he's trying to change the outcome, he's trying to change the, uh, what's going to happen. And then verse 41, he begins to get consumed with this hatred. And it kind of reminds me of that guy that wanted to do his, his evangelistic ministry. And Brother Collins said, no, yeah, I think we've got to wait for a little while and work with you and, and see you know, some changes in your life. And he said, how dare you judge me and all that. And you know what? Every time I went to visit him, see where he's been, why he hadn't been in church, you know what he would say? I mean, just, he would just have this spiteful nature, and he'd just talk about the pastor, and he'd just want to run him down. And I can't believe he. And what does he think? He's perfect, right? Everybody's got to be perfect. And I'm thinking, man, you've allowed bitterness to enter because you didn't get what you wanted. And, you know, where's that faith? Where's that following the Lord and wanting what's best, you know, whatever the Lord find, thinks is best for you, that's what you want. No, he had to have it his way. And so here he is whining. You could probably play that in your mind. A lot of people, a lot of different people. That's just the guy that's coming to mind. 
uh, to my mind right now. So he allows hatred to consume him, verse 41. Esau, and Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. After Isaac dies, he says, that's it. After my time of mourning, I'm going to slay my brother. And we know in the end some of that gets resolved. But still, here's how he deals with this. Okay, And then, to his shame, it's like he lives in Jacob's shadow. Have you ever met anybody like that? It's like they didn't get what they wanted. And somebody else maybe gets a promotion. They didn't get a promotion. And then it's all of a sudden like... like if they become this real shame, like trying to outdo that other person or show that they're capable. Oh, yeah, you did that. Oh, yeah, watch. Look what I can do. Look what I can do. And you're like, man, stop. You're embarrassing yourself, right? Just accept the fact that that's not what God had for you and go on to do something else, right? And so here's what he does. Uh, look at Genesis. Uh, let me see here. Same chapter. Look at uh, verse 34. Let me see here. Uh, no, that's not right. Let me see. Oh, I'm sorry. Chapter 28. Look at chapter 28. Okay. When Esau saw that, his, uh, that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padanaram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, uh, he gave him a charge saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, and Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padanaram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto him wives, which he had of uh, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, and sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. Now, if you back up in that story, you see, uh, actually before all this even happened, you see that Esau took unto him daughters of the Canaanites. And it said this thing was a grief to his mother and his father, right? And so now that he sees all this happening and Jacob got the blessing and, and now he's getting uh, all these blessings and Isaac is sending him off and, and all, he says, well, man, I got to please him. I, it doesn't, they don't like the fact that I have Canaanite wives, right? I'm going to go take some wives from Ishmael. <laughs> like, that's a whole lot better. But what he's doing in his mind is he's thinking, well, look, look what I can do. Look what I can do. And he's just embarrassing himself, right? Just be content with what God has for you in your life. And don't be trying to, you know, take over somebody else's or show that you can one-up them or do better than them. That's the sign of somebody who's not walking by faith, but they're trying to knock doors open and, open and, and create their own, uh, out, the outcome and their, uh, of their faith. Okay, so, so here's what he does. He uh, pretty much becomes a shame, right, as he tries to do this. And, of course, we still talk about him in a very negative uh, light even today. So some people, they act like Esau. Some people, when the outcome of their faith, I mean, look, that's what Hebrews 11 said, by faith he blessed them. You say, yeah, but he didn't know that was going to happen. Right. Yeah, but after it was found out that he did that, he said, so it will be, right? He's this, it is, what's done is done. This is what God's will. And he probably remembered back to some indications earlier that that was God's will in the first place. Right. And he was the one trying to make it different and to bless the wrong son. But anyway, so Isaac then responds differently than Esau does. Isaac, it seems, oh, it bothered him. It bothered him. It said that he trembled. Right. He was really upset. He had just been tricked. I mean, maybe there's more to it. Maybe he trembled a little bit out of realizing that God uh, had a different plan and he's been going against God. I don't know. But he seems like he trembled and he was upset about it. But then in that very same sentence, he's saying, and it shall be done. I'm, I'm misquoting it probably, but he's saying it shall be done. And then he does the best he can to give his son a blessing, but he, uh, he just kind of moves on. It seems like he gets with the program. And then uh, look, at verse, uh, look at chapter 28, verse 1. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the uh, daughters of the Canaanites. See, this is what made Esau mad when he saw him blessing, his, uh, blessing Jacob. But you see, he realized, okay, the blessing is on Jacob, right? Not what I expected, not necessarily what I wanted. I wanted my hairy, smelly son. And uh, instead, the smooth son's getting the blessing. That's okay. And he takes him and he says, hey, I, I, I'm going to bless you. 
and I'm going to send you on your way. Let me just give you some advice. Don't take any wives of the Canaanites or whatever. And you got Esau over here saying, what, what, what is that? What do I got to do? You know, trying to get in on that. God is saying, is, is, uh, I mean, Isaac is kind of accepting, hey, this is not what I expected. It was a surprise to me. I didn't like it at first. Now I'm going to get with the program and I'm just going to uh, step in line and do what pleases the Lord. If only we could learn sometimes that we are not going to get what we want in this life. <laughs> if we could just learn uh, that when they don't go as planned, we might be still exactly in the will of the Lord, right? And here's how do you know? This is, again, you know, somebody's like, how do I know? Well, here's the problem. Most of the people that have come to me in my lifetime and asked, how do I, how do I know if I'm in the will of God? You know what it usually is? They've got something in their head that they really want. And really, that's the only answer that they're going to be content with. Right. You know, if I give them the right answer where they get what they want, then they'll say, okay, that's great advice. Right. But if they don't get that, then they're like, no, 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 i got to find another, uh, some more advice, you know, or something. Because they don't really understand it. But, man, if we would just realize, if our desire is, Lord, what do you want? Thy will be done. Then if we start going and we say, whoa, that's not what I expected at all. But God knows best, so I'm going to keep on going. And I tell people, look, God will shut doors in your life if he wants them shut. And he will open doors in uh, your life if he wants them open. And I'm not saying just walk around flippantly without any kind of plans. I'm just saying be sensitive to the will of God. But if you love him and your desire is, what do you want me to do, Lord? How can I best serve you? How can I be of more value in your kingdom? You show me, why is he not going to show you? That would be weird, right? <laughs> oh, there's a guy really faithful, really wants me to, he really wants what's best for his life, and, and I can give him that, you know. Just kidding. <laughs> just, why would he do that? He's going to lead you there. And so you just walk by faith and say, I really, I'm really not seeking my own will. I really am seeking the, the Lord's will. I really am willing to give certain things up. You know, maybe this is what I really wanted in my life, but I'm willing to give that up. And uh, in the end, hoping that I still end up in God's will. And you will if that's what you're wanting to do. Real quickly, look at Romans chapter 8. I want you all to go ahead and stand. And I was just going to read it to you, but I think it would be good for us all to read this together. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. I'm not even going to give any commentary on it afterwards. We're just going to read it and then be dismissed in a word of prayer. Romans chapter 8, let's all read verse 28 together. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word uh, that's a light unto our path and that we can, uh, it can guide us and get us through life, even though we might not understand the course that you have for us sometimes. Lord, we do seek, uh, seek your face and we seek your will to be done in our lives where you'd be most pleased with us and that you would be the most uh, glorified and we'd produce the most fruit for your name's sake. I pray, Lord, that you'll just show us what that will is and help us by faith take each step uh, that you would guide us and, and direct us to take. And uh, in the end, we do want you to receive all the glory, Lord. Help us not forget that and help us live daily by faith in Jesus' name. Amen.